if you'll indulge me for like a minute. So whenever I'm learning some new engine or tech, my hello world of game dev is something I call jumper. All I need to know is how to get input and how to draw a pixel or a cube, because the physics code is like three lines long. So what you're watching now is the version I made when I was starting Love 2D. But I've also made it in Mode 13 for the earliest PCs, and in Blueprints in Unreal 4 when you still had to pay $5 for accessing the source. I also made a joke Michael Bay version, and a split screen version too. There's a few others, but you get the drift. So then I remember 8086 Tiny, and thought it'd be funny to emulate the 8086 PC and run that version of Jumper inside Unreal. And then I thought it'd be funny to run Wolfenstein for the Carrot Run Doom joke. So then I had to upgrade my emulator plugin to get a 286, and I used an ancient port of PCM that I made for the Raspberry Pi bare metal. And then I thought it'd be awesome to have Wolfenstein come from a cover disc from a magazine, so I had to implement disc swapping. And then I thought it would be cool to be able to read that magazine, so I had to create a PDF plugin for Unreal. And then I thought it'd be fun to run Unreal in Unreal, so I needed a newer version of PCM and chose 86 bucks for a change of scenery. And then... Okay, so before we get the technical stuff, I thought we could just walk around the environment and just appreciate things a little. Like, this 3D model of this PC is just absolutely gorgeous. I know it's not the right model, but it's just so pretty, I don't care. And uh, yeah, the description contains links on where to find these things. As for the background, I just followed a Ducky 3D tutorial on how to do a synthwave environment inside Blender. Worked out pretty well, I think. And then the magazine, oh, a joke that went way too far. So the hardest part of this entire thing was finding a PDF of a magazine that I could find a high quality cover for that actually had cover disc images I could find, as in disc images, and had stickers on them. Oh, man. Anyway, I think it worked out pretty well. And yeah, even though this is a pretty low res texture, it's very readable just as is. And yeah, you may have noticed that there's this laser pointer going around just to help you look at things and what you can interact with. And it disappears when you look at the monitor. This is to indicate that it's hijacked your input. So if you press space to, you know, when you're typing, your character doesn't jump. So if you look down, you can now jump again. Um, the PC also has hard drive and floppy drive activity lights. They also play appropriate noises for writing, reading, seeking. Um, but I've disabled them for this video just because it's a voiceover video. So yeah, let's let's see. Um, let's turn this on as a 286. So nice, quick, easy boot. And if you look at the hard drive lights, yep, yeah, if we do on A, yep. Um, I wonder, does that run? It does too. Okay, so yeah. Uh, the first thing I think I want to do is, yeah, sure is run jumper i know you've seen a lot of it today but just give me two secs so it's kind of washed out right but that's because the screen's on the brightness brightest setting so if you mouse wheel down you can turn the brightness of the screen down and it looks about good so the whole reason why i'm running this is i actually want to show so i'm orange at the moment and now i've implemented this fake ambi light so if i enable it you see it's now orangey and if i then go up to the blue platform it changes to blue all it's doing is getting the uh, average of the color on the screen and then normalizing it and bam, that's it. So if I go back to DOS, it's now black. And if I get some white on the screen, well, now it's all white. So yeah, uh, as for changing the disk, let's play Lemmings. I mean, sometimes the disks would slide forever and go off the edge. So I just put a little net there to catch them. All right, so if I go to A, yeah, and these floppy disks, um, they're just a 3D model with a, a path assigned to them. So you just point them to a, a disk image and then they just appear on the machine. So let's play Christmas Lemmings. Sure, uh, sure. Alrighty, and um, yeah, so if you're moving, if you're looking around like this, actually, let's go into the game. So yes, that's fine. So if you wanted to move the mouse, obviously your head would continue moving. So if you middle click, you then get control of the, the mouse cursor. So I can now go E. And then if I want to look around again, I can just middle click and then I get the mouse back. So yeah, this is pretty much it. Uh, I'll get into some of the more technical details now, but if there's anything else you'd like to see, just let me know in the comments and I'll come back to it.
Okay, so what is 8086Tiny? This is 8086Tiny. It's an emulator for 8086 XT PC, but as you can clearly see, it's no ordinary emulator. It's the result of an amazing entry to the obfuscated C contest. Fortunately, the source for the obfuscated version is available, and is super handy for having an emulator in a single C file, with a very obvious place of where it draws the screen. Now it was only my intention to get this running in Unreal to show my Mode 13 version of Jumper running, but we all know how that turned out. Now this is the part of the video where I was going to say how I first had to learn how to dynamically change a texture at runtime, and there were only old sources, and I had to pull them together and congeal them into one working version, and I put it up on GitHub, and you're welcome, and in Doing this video, I had to search for some of the old sources so I could show them on screen here. But guess what? Since then, someone has actually made a new library to actually just dynamically change the texture at runtime within a reel. So thanks to that person, and just a bit late. Anyway, a link for that will be in the description below. The next thing I knew I had to do was to somehow get the input from every single key on the keyboard. Now, Unreal has these things where you can set up events, but I didn't want to have to uh, bind a key to every single event. So I did a bit of digging and found the raw input plugin for Unreal. But that still looked like you had to do some kind of setup and it just felt like too much reading. And like I said earlier, this was just in my way of getting to my goal. So there are other disgusting ways of doing this. Meet get key state. It's a Win32 call. You can just call it at any time and it will tell you if a key is up or down. And now, because I didn't want to have to learn Unreal's build system either, I just shoved a pragma in there to link the lib. Yep, like I said, hack. So once I had 8086Tiny running with input in my dynamic textures, I wanted a little bit more grunt. And I knew that I already had a horribly hacked together port of an ancient version of PCEM lying around. So I took that and turned it into a DLL that I could load and unload dynamically from my fancy new Unreal plugin. But sadly, being outdated, it only got me up to a 286, which was good enough for Wolfenstein, but I really wanted to do the Doom joke, so I needed to do something to get myself a 486. Instead of just updating the latest vanilla PCEM, I decided to try 86 box for a change, because that's just the way the wind was blowing that day. And ooh-wee was this a bit of a pain. It's a project that heavily leans towards MingW and GCC land. First I had a bunch of switch case statements that relied on the new range syntax. So I ended up making a Python script to go through all the files and generate a new case line for every numeric value in the range, or in the case of enums, blindly copying the enum entries from the start to the end entry, hoping that they were sequential in nature. Then I hit the fact that Visual Studio doesn't support standard atomic yet. Well, not really, it does in a preview release. So I downloaded it, gave it a go, but then got several clashes between the C++ and C compiler language versions of them, and ugh. See, every time I went to do experiment, I had to go in and change the setting on every project in the solution manually. So having done that twice, I simply made my own replacement for standard atomic. Having finally replaced SDL calls with my real plugin ones, I could finally run the emulator, which crashed instantly. Now this is the only problem with working the way I do. It's at this point where you have to wonder which of the thousand hacks you did could be causing this. Turns out it was crashing inside the dynamic recompilation code, the last place I would ever want to have to look at. The emulator would also run so horribly slow without it enabled. But then I realized that one line was missing a check against Visual Studio 64 bitness. So I changed that and bam, Unreal Tournament at 60 frames a second. Booyah. So where does this leave us? I'm not sure really. I started as a joke. Look Doug, I added ray tracing to System Shock. And me wanting to say that it's okay to sometimes just hack things. That making a pinky swear to see that a functional exists at link time is the best way to bypass abstraction plumbing. But now that I have a Pentium class PC in the game world, my mind starts wondering about controlling robots via the COM port or setting up virtual BBSs. And I start wondering, maybe I should make something out of this. Does it run Doom though? Well, of course it does. Wait, why is it so slow? Well, that's because it's the SNES version running under Z SNES, running under Windows 98, running under x86 box, running under Unreal, running under...